my name is Maxim Kennison. I'm from UC Irvine. I am an anesthesiologist, and I'm going to present you my uh, project, uh, which is an uh, uh, enhanced recovery after surgery program to improve outcome in patients undergoing high-risk uh, surgery. These are my conflict of interest. I'm a speaker for these companies, and I have some uh, grant and fundings that I'm presenting here on this uh, slide. So when we think about uh, healthcare uh, quality, and if we consider that healthcare should be a, a high reliability organization, ideally, what we would like to uh, obtain is to have a very high level of care with a narrow uh, standard deviation. But in practice, what we observe most of the time, it's a pretty good level of care, but with wide standard deviation. And what we learn from uh, uh, quality improvement is that if we raise the lower bar, of the healthcare quality, then mechanically we are going to increase the average level of care we provide to our patients. And this is all about the standardization of care and the application of evidence-based to our patients. Our program, the Enhanced Recovery After Surgery program, uh, the aim is to improve post-operative outcome of high-risk surgery patient. And the plan is to apply these best evidence, best practices that focus on four main variables, which are the post-operative pain management, the post-operative nausea and vomiting prevention, the intraoperative fluid management and hemodynamic optimization, both fall under the umbrella of what we call goal-directed therapy, and blood transfusion. Most of these items, they are already in place in most of the hospitals within the UC Health system. However, our goal is to try to implement these variables that have been linked to post-operative outcome in a systematic fashion to all patients undergoing high-risk surgery. What is the conceptual framework behind this program? It relies on the relationship between the volume status of patients undergoing high-risk surgery and the rates of perioperative complication. What we know, it's been shown uh, many, many times in many institutions all over the world, is that there is a U-shape relationship between the volumic status of high-risk surgery patient and perioperative complication. And either some patient present with hypervolemia during surgery or hypovolemia, in both situations, this is going to increase the rate of postoperative complication. Related to this physiological evidence, we have a lot of studies, more than 25 or 30 studies, showing that during high-risk surgery, when fluid and hemodynamics are optimized, we observe an improvement in post-operative morbidity, an improvement in post-operative mortality, a decrease in the length of stay in the hospital, and overall, a decrease in the cost of the surgical procedure. This uh, meta-analysis has been published two years ago. It's a study coming from the UK. Uh, it includes 2,400 patients, and very clearly, uh, this approach has been shown to improve patient outcome. This evidence has been deemed strong enough by some uh, institutions in Europe, like in uh, Denmark, in the UK, in Sweden, and recently in France, to come up with very strong recommendations about a systematic approach for fluid management and hemodynamic optimization of patients undergoing high-risk surgery. For example, in the UK, the NHS released in 2011 this recommendation, and they estimate that if this approach was applied in all patients undergoing high-risk surgery in the UK. This would benefit about 800,000 patients every year, and it would make net financial savings of over 400 million pounds, which is about $600 million every year for the NHS. In January 2013, the NHS now has some incentive, and 2.5% of the budget of NHS hospital rely on the application of this concept. So we have the knowledge, we know the physiology, we have the evidence-based medicine showing the improvement in outcome, we have the tools to apply it at the bedside, so do we do it? In 2011, we conducted a survey uh, at UC Irvine among uh, anesthesiologists from the American Society of Anesthesiology and European Society of Anesthesiology, and we showed, as you can see here, that in the vast majority of institutions, there is no guidelines, no protocol for fluid management and hemodynamic optimization for patients undergoing high-risk surgery, despite all of the evidence. So what did we do 
at UCR Vine in order to try to change the practice uh, related to fluid management and hemodynamic optimization in this population. The approach we wanted to apply is a patient-centered approach, and the goal is to improve patient satisfaction, to improve efficiency, innovation, and the teamwork of all the healthcare providers taking care of this patient in the perioperative period. We started by building a, a, a team of clinical practitioners uh, in order to identify high-risk surgery patient, and as soon as we identify the high-risk surgery patient, we place them in some kind of clinical pathway. To achieve this goal, we were uh, supported by our uh, uh, chairman, Dr. Kane, and the uh, vice chair for quality. We had the support also from the administration that helped us uh, with the billing and all the process related to the administration. And uh, when we applied for this uh, CHQI fellowship, we had the backup from our chief medical officer. This project also was included in a vast group of perioperative healthcare providers, including the nurses, the anesthesiology uh, technician, the information technology people, the surgeon, residents, and so it's a team approach for the improvement of this patient. The first thing we did was to try to change the knowledge related to fluid management, hemodynamic optimization, and outcome related to high-risk surgery patients. So we developed a curriculum which was mandatory for all CRNAs, residents, and anesthesiologists in charge of this patient. We had an online training uh, and a bedside training to apply the concept at the bedside with the, the team leaders. And we, we did a pretest before the implementation of the learning module and after the implementation. We used the intranet from our department to present all the modules for teaching the concept and uh, having all practitioners had to apply it at the bedside. You can see an example of all the modules, uh, the uh, education with audio, videos, and so forth. So it was online for three months, and once again, it was mandatory for everyone. We use technology like the anesthesia information management system to track the application of this concept at the bedside so that we were able to measure whether or not this concept was applied for the patient. The way we assessed this uh, project, we did a baseline evaluation one year. It's a historical group. Then we started the training three months with a pretest before and a post-test after the training, and then the implementation for, uh, five, for one year. And we used what we call a quasi-experimental study design to assess uh, the impact. We focused on the three main surgery, pancreatic, liver, and cancer debulking, which are the highest risk surgery patient. We started with this small population in order then to expand it to other, uh, other patient population. What you observe is that uh, before the implementation, the implementation of the full ERAS program was only 8%. After we started this training, it went up to 62% of the patient undergoing high risk surgery. We were able, one of the most uh, important impact has been on the decrease in fluid administration. We decreased fluid by about 40%, especially on the crystalloid. We decreased the crystalloid by 40%. And this has been uh, linked to a decreased transfusion by 45% to 35% of the patient, just probably because w the less we dilute the patient, the less we see a drop in hematocrit, and then the, mo the less likely we are to transfuse patients who just have hemodilution. Uh, at the same time, we observed a slight decrease in length of stay. It's not significant yet. We hope that at the end of the project, we'll be able to show significance. But as you know, these outcome data are not normally distributed. So we need a lot of patients to see an impact on, uh, on outcome. But this is here what we call a time series analysis, where here you have the time, the date, when we started the program. This dashed line here is the beginning of the intervention. And here you have the length of stay in the hospital. And you can see that before we, the implementation of this program, so we had a lot of patients who stayed a very long time. And that after the implementation, we still have patients with complications. We cannot make them disappear. We still have some complications. But overall, the incidence of these patients staying a long time in the hospital uh, decreased dramatically bef uh, compared to before the implementation. So as a conclusion, this implementation uh, during high-risk surgery, the implementation of this ERAS program, which is based on, once again, evidence-based medicine. It's not rocket science. It's very basic uh, clinical implementation. It induced first a significant change in the knowledge that led to a significant change in practice. And then uh, this change in knowledge and practice induced a decrease in blood transfusion 
and it looks like we have a trend toward a decrease in the length of stay in the hospital, in the ICU. And we did not do a financial analysis, but it's more likely that it will have an impact too. So the perspective is to implement this ERAS program first at UC Irvine on one specific high-risk surgery. We go for an easy win, because these are the patients with long length of stay, and then spread it out to other surgery and hopefully to other uh, institution within the UC uh, system. Thank you very much. I want to thank the CHQI for giving me this opportunity. It's been a huge uh, opportunity for me to bring all my basic research on cardiovascular physiology then to the clinical bedside. Thank you very much. Thank you.